Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Kelly with Wikibon. We're here inside the Cube at Strata in Santa Clara. Uh, I'm joined today uh, by my colleague, David Floyer, uh, and we've got an interesting guest on today. We've got Lawrence Schwartz. Uh, he's the Vice President of Marketing at Toku Tech. Um, they are a, a company that's uh, attempting to scale MySQL to big data workloads. Um, you guys are going to be in the startup showcase, I understand, this evening. So why don't you uh, introduce us, our, our viewers, to uh, Toku Tech. Sure. So Tokutech is a company that looks at the big data problem from the database side. A lot of databases that you look at today um, are built on a relational model, and as they get much larger and they start scaling out, the performance doesn't really keep up. And so a lot of customers will look towards alternatives, maybe going to um, you know more expensive hardware like Flash or NoSQL. Um, and what we do is we actually fix relational databases. We fix the SQL model. And we do that by going in there and addressing the core indexing technology. The core indexing technology that you find in relational databases has been around for the last 30 or 40 years based on a technology called B-Trees, and we offer a real alternative to that called Fractal Trees, and that's what we productize. We make available today for MySQL, and databases can scale up to terabytes plus um, and really have the performance they can do um, that people would otherwise leave the platform for and try something else. Interesting. So, because one of the, the kind of the, the genesis of the uh, so-called big data movement is the, um, and as Wikibon defines it, is the um, big data is those data sets that are too large or, or do their type that a, the traditional relational databases can't handle. So, there's the Hadoop model, which is kind of a different model, and then it sounds like what you guys are trying to do is um, adapt the relational model to fit into the big data landscape. Is that? That, that's correct, and a lot of people find that they'll start on a, on a very common database like MySQL, and they'll start small, and then if their business takes off, they start putting more and more into it, and they like the model, they like the relational capabilities, they like the indexing capability, they like all the tools they have, the expertise out there, and then as performance starts to drop off, it's only then that they start thinking, what else can I do? And as you know, sometimes they'll throw up their hands and say, I've got to try something else completely different, and in some cases that makes sense. Um, but in a lot of cases, if they could fix it and not have to do things like you know, partition their database and deal with all those management headaches, if they could do this without having to you know, buy much more expensive hardware like flash drives or RAM, or if they could avoid going to a column store or something very, very different that might not have some of the other relational database flexibility, they would do that and we give them a real way to do that. Interesting. David, what is your take? So, uh, can, can you give us your examples of people using it? Um, what, what are some of the big names in the valley, for example, that might be using your technology to avoid sure, awful sure. things like having to restructure your uh, database? A absolutely. So, there's um, you know some very common cases out there where you look at like online advertising. So, we have uh, one customer based out of New York, Intent Media, that looks at user behavior online during an interactive session. Um, and they might be in the, you know, looking at if somebody's bought black shoes, black pants, are they going to buy a black blazer next? And that's real-time data coming in. They're trying to compare that against their existing database. And insert an advert and, and for insert, black, and, uh, sweater. And, and get that blazer yeah. advertisement yeah. in there. Yeah. And so that's one way that um, you know, the model gets used because it's kind of real-time interactive. And they looked at alternatives, um, and we talk about that with them, of, of other ways of doing it, and they settled with you know, a, a SQL model. Another big player is uh, Limelight Networks, they're a public company, um, and they've offered in the past few months, they came out with a cloud storage um, offering, and the unique thing about their cloud storage offering is that it has all sorts of quality of service guarantees for it. Um, and part of it is they're managing oftentimes a lot of, say, video assets and other things, a lot of metadata attached, so they could have billions of assets of, um, or metadata assets to manage, and that's what we can help them do. And, and again, that's the real time, plus the combination of you know big database and, and, and pulling stuff in and out of it. So those are some of the typical plays. Well, there's, there's a lot of chat around other types of database, no SQL, Mongo, sure. things like that. So yeah. what's, what are the use cases that will push people towards you versus Mongo? Yeah, can, yeah. Can you talk about the, the difference in the marketplace there? A absolutely. Um, what we find is that um, you know if you look at databases as they were designed in the past 30 or 40 years or so, um, they were very good to handle all types of workloads, you know, OLTP workloads, OLAP workloads, read intensive workloads, write intensive workloads. Um, and that was fine you know, 30 or 40 years ago when you had very basic databases, maybe HR records, very sequential, 
data was coming in in a very orderly fashion. Um, and then as data, you know, as the actual underlying hardware got faster and the drives got faster, um, and then you know you went to more online applications, social media applications. All of a sudden, you know, you people started breaking off the traditional model, and you have these OLTP and OLAP specialties, right? Um, as well as some of these NoSQL specialties. So I think people will go and um, get frustrated today with the um, the relational model. And they say, okay, I can't keep up my indexing, for example, so I'm going to give it up completely and just um, you know, get the data in as fast as possible. But if you think of it as like a library, right? A library is nice and organized, the Dewey Decimal System, um, but if somebody backs up a truckload of books to dump off, um, it's very hard to take those books and put them in quickly, and that's where people get frustrated and they might go to an alternative. The problem with some of those NoSQL alternatives is you're basically taking a lot of the data and you're just dumping it in and getting it there, and then you'll apply a lot of processing power to it later to get through it. Um, and for some workloads, you, that, that's the appropriate thing to do, and that makes sense. But for workloads where you might actually come in and do repeatable queries, because um, whenever you have an index, no matter what the technology is, the index is always you know, 10 to uh, you know, 100 times faster. So if you do have a repeatable you know, query at some point in time and you can stand up more indexes, um, that's where we really have the, the value differentiation. Um, and, and that's part of it. P you know, because we can insert at 20x, we have our customers do 80x, you can therefore keep up a much richer set of indexes. So uh, what are the, one of the technologies that a lot of the uh, startup companies uh, have used uh, to, to solve this problem of large databases, and, and a lot of the issues are around long, low latent, sorry, long latencies onto disk. Mm -hmm. um, they get locking problems, they get issues like that, so they have used Flash, um, sure. and people like Fusion IO, for example, they've used Flash, uh, actually using atomic writes to Flash, mm -hmm. um, as techniques for reducing that latency as low as possible. Right. Um, what, how would your uh, solution compare with that way of doing things, of taking, a, taking that uh, issue away of, of the, the very slow database? Sure, sure, it, and it's a great question, and, and it really gets around to um, you know, what got me interested in the company, because my background was in storage originally, um, is that when you look at how the data comes out to a, a, a disk today, um, if everything's nice and orderly and coming in you know, non-random fashion, a spinning disk does well with it. The data just kind of maps in well and all flows in there. When you have more random interactive workloads, you know, now you're making the disk head jump all over the place, right? And the performance just goes down quite you a have bit. Them yeah. it, it, exactly. Um, so what we do is instead of having a very static um, B tree like a traditional database, the fractal tree is much more dynamic, rebalancing of the loads as they come in. So as they come in, it kind of pushes them down, it keeps them at nodes, it waits for more data that matches it to come into a node, and then it aggregates it before it gets out the disk. So by the time you're actually writing to disk, you're writing out, you're basically filling up the train, right, rather than sending out one car at a time. So we get much more efficient use of the I.O. to the disk, so we get that advantage. Um, and then that also carries over to, to Flash in that, you know, flashes don't write to, you know, one bit at a time, they kind of do a whole group at once. Similar type of thing, if you can get a bigger basket of data to come in when you write to that piece of Flash, then you'll get those additional benefits and get more performance even out of flash out of drive flash as, well. as well. Exactly. Okay. So what, one of the interests that I've had uh, recently is that this this whole area of big data is yeah. both transactional and it's uh, it's operational. It's it's analytic as well. Sure. Yes. So um, um, one of my posits is that uh, as this technology develops. The real end game is being able to enable organizations to design their analytics as part of their operational system. Sure. And there have been a huge number of barriers to that, and, and I.O. is being one of the major barriers. Right, right. So is, are you, is, do you agree with that? And, and to what extent can your technology enable that sort of vision? Yeah. It, it's, can it can it enable it for very large companies, or is it maybe only just very small companies that can do this at the moment? Yeah, no, you're, um, you've, um, you know, you've got a, you know, you've got the great story that um, we, you know, we try to tell people, and I think you've nailed it right there, which is, um, you know, a lot of people are going in the two different directions for, for managing this, the two different environments, um, and we let it, we let people combine. Oftentimes, our application will start a more of an offline. They'll try it for analytics, and then they'll try, you know, combining it into their real-time environment, 
and because they can handle, you know, we can handle such a high insertion rate and stand up so many more indexes, now you can do both, right? You can um, compare us to the, tr the traditional, or not the traditional, but the default storage engine that you get with MySQL. We actually are better on, um, uh, better on read performance um, for doing a, a, a different types of workload scenarios, and we're 20x faster on some insertion environments. So you get the both of, of, of the best of both worlds, in that you get the high amounts of reads, the high amounts of writes, and now you've got you know the use case that you're talking about, where you can actually work on more uh, analytics on transactional data, or the flip way of looking at it, right, is transactions data, yeah, with with sure. the, with the uh, large data warehouse. Yeah. Um, and we've got, um, you know, we've been able to do this with, um, demonstrate it with, you know, tens of billions of rows. So we've got the scalability there. We've got customers doing, you know, multi-terabyte deployments today. Um, and it really comes down to how do you change the fundamental model of how you do a relational database. And it's pretty exciting. Our technology comes out of uh, MIT, Rutgers, and Stony Brook. Some smart guys who have worked at some very big uh, other algorithmic companies and have done a lot of research on this over the past 10 years. So it's a very, very new and fresh way of approaching it. So um, where's Tellutech going from here? So uh, are you sure. looking to be acquired by one of these other <laughs> companies so they can combine it all, or what's what's your what's your game plan? Sure, uh, sure. Well, we are we are growing. Um, we've been out for a few years, and we've added more and more capabilities that people expect in a relational model. So um, you know, over the years, we added Acid and MVCC, and then we've gotten our in-memory performance on our latest release comparable to um, the basic default engine. Um, so a we Hana look alike. What's that? A Hana look alike. <laughs> so um, yeah, we've we've really you know built it so that people don't have to make a decision at least with MySQL. So we're still a small company, but we're growing quite a bit, and we we want to be you know the default uh, engine that people use with MySQL. Um, you know, I'd say that's kind of our immediate goal, um, and uh, long term we'd like to see this in all types of relational databases. So uh, you know, one question we're asking everybody who comes on the cube, uh, very big picture. What is big data's potential to change society, as uh, our colleague John Furrier puts it? Um, kind of taking a step back from the nitty gritty of the technical uh, details, what do you see as the real potential of this movement, both what you're doing and, and some of the other players we're seeing here at, at, um, at Strata? What, what can big data do for society? We also heard a lot in the keynotes this morning about sure. uh, the big problems. Um, can you kind of expound on that a little bit? Sure, sure. Um, you know, we've, uh, um, you know, we see a lot of, you know, commercial uses today, as, as I mentioned. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of interesting, you know, research uses. So we've talked with, um, you know, one company who's trying out our stuff, and they're actually a research facility. Um, they work for the government, and they're looking at um, all sorts of astrophysical, you know, uses, and looking at the sky, and looking at the environment, and trying to figure out where the gamma rays are coming from and where they're going to and what's that mean for the planet and how's the universe growing. So it's kind of a very interesting, much, much bigger question. I can't say they're our typical customer, but they get us pretty excited when they call in and they say, okay, we're doing this instrumentation on this satellite um, and we're trying you with this phase and we have all this kind of oncoming machine data. Um, and it's kind of an exciting alternative use for us that tells us more about you know, what we're going to buy next mm -hmm. week, which is important in, in how we make money, but this answers a lot of the bigger questions. All right, great. All right, well, Lawrence, thanks so much for coming on. Sure. Uh, Toku Tech, go check them out, tokutech.com. Uh, good luck tonight in the spotlight, uh, or I should say the startup competition. Uh, when is that tonight, 8 o'clock? It is, uh, it starts at 6.30, we'll be there at 8 o'clock, and yeah, definitely come by All right, and yeah, if you're, if you're here on site at the Strata Conference, definitely check it out. Um, again, thanks so much for coming on. Great. And I think we're going to take a short break, and we'll be back shortly. Thanks again.